So for the past few months, you've been hearing me say that this is the best solution for putting us back on the lunar surface, that it's not the lunar starship, that it's certainly not the blue origin solution, but this, the alpaca lander, is the right solution to put us back on the moon. And I've been using research and information and my own judgment, that sort of thing. But where else really would be a good place to get information on this particular lander? Lander that may very well be returning us to the lunar surface for the first time in over half a century. Well, what about Dynetics themselves? Get ready for an exclusive interview here on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good morning and welcome back to The Angry Astronaut. We have with us today Kathy Lorini, who is with the Dynetics Corporation. We are very, very honored to have her on the program. She recently retired from NASA after 36 years of supporting NASA human spaceflight programs and projects. Um, her most recent work was in support of human space exploration strategy and planning. Um, she also led the development of the Global Exploration Roadmap, which is a product of the space agencies participating in the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Um, she is also a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, um, which I have actually several family members who graduated from that school as well. So, uh, and she holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Um, in addition to that, she also served as deputy director for space life sciences and the first program manager for the human research project, a uh, program rather with NASA. Welcome to the program, ma'am. Jordan, I'm glad to be here. So a quick first and obvious question. Um, what makes the Alpaca landing system the best choice? Uh, there, there's a couple of features of our lander that make it uh, very uh, effective and, um, and well suited for the Artemis mission. Um, with the the, the low-slung crew module, as you, you see from the very familiar images, um, our ability, it, that provides the ability for the crew to, you know, directly see the lunar surface when they're landing, and it provides a, uh, an easy egress path down to the lunar surface. So, so the complexity of the crew mission on the surface is significantly reduced with our solution. Um, and another good advantage is just the, the crew-centric design. You know, we have um, involved a number of former astronauts in our design and, and, and have greatly used their, relied on their expertise to, to design a lander that's easy to fly and, and um, simplifies the crew task so that it leaves a lot more time for them when they get to the surface to perform the, the mission that, that NASA is looking for. So um, those are two, you know, the crew, the crew-centric nature, the, the additional safety features of, of our design with the low-slung um, crew module are big differentiators. I think that, that low-slung crew module is also um, interesting if you think forward to how to use the, the alpaca in a cargo delivery service, right? You know, you can, you can almost think of the crew module as, as a payload, really, and, and, and fly the alpaca without the crew module. Um, if you replace the crew module with, say, a pressurized rover or a, or a surface habitat, um, our lander allows you to, to, you know, put it down gently on the surface of the moon without the need for, for cranes or elevators or other, other complex surface capabilities to, to offload cargo. So, so, so that's something that we like. And, and as I say, one last distinction. 
distinguishing feature, um, you know, because what NASA is really trying to do with the Artemis program is is usher in a, a real robust era of of human exploration and utilization of space. So exploration in the sense of new discoveries and finding what's out there, but but utilization in a sense of you know, how can we expand the Earth's economy to the area around the moon? And, and key to establishing that economy is going to be refueling capability around the moon. And, um, and so our architecture is the only one where where we we rely on, on fueling uh, in lunar orbit in order to accomplish our mission. So those investments um, will translate into, you know, the, the first investments in the kind of fuel depots that will enable refueling of, of other lander and other logistics capabilities and, and, and smaller clips landers as well. So we're kind of excited about that step towards opening the lunar economy. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that. And I am actually a big advocate for fuel depots myself. So since we've brought up the topic, um, and once again, if this is proprietary, I understand, do you, um, are, have you folks decided what sort of fuel you're going to be using for this system? Yeah, we're going to be using lox methane. Okay, so you're going to be using the same thing that's being used by SpaceX currently, um, or something similar to it. Is that correct? More or less, and and other other robotic landers are using lox methane. So um, it, it's a nice choice, and it is the performance of a cryogenic system with a better storability than 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 liquid hydrogen. Now I have another question for you. Since the uh, the lunar samples that were brought back by Apollo did not uh, include a great deal of carbon, there's been some concern expressed in terms of the ability of in situ manufacturing of methylox fuel on the moon. Um, do you have information to suggest that there may be something on the moon that would allow for that sort of in situ production, or do you have some other plan in mind? Well, our vision um, that we talked about in a, in a webinar that we conducted uh, several weeks ago, maybe you saw it or your listeners saw it, but um, our, our vision is a is a, is a liquid oxygen production plant on the surface of the moon. So the, the, the data from Apollo samples and from orbital spacecraft since then um, indicates that there's um, a lot of oxygen bound in, in the regolith. And, uh, and so, it, and it's, it's, it's um, you know, it can be, it can be um, harvested, if you will, and, and prepared for use in, in generating the, the liquid oxygen part of our of our propellant system. So, so we're going to be looking at potential partners that we can work with, um, including you know non space industry partners to help try to to realize that capability, so that um, at some point in the future we can refill our lander on the surface with with liquid oxygen that's produced there. I understand. Wonderful. And in terms of, uh, you know, since obviously methylox requires methane as well, um, do you folks have a plan as to as to where you will get that? Or do you think that you'll be able to manufacture the methane on the fuel as well or m the methane rather on the moon? I mean, I think if you can get methane, no, I don't. I mean, we're not pursuing a, a, a path of, of producing methane on the moon, and I'm not sure how you would do that. So you're right there. I think, you know, you could get methane from Earth delivered to cislunar space. There's a lot of talk about reusable, you know, logistic systems that, that, that push things back and forth between the Earth and the Moon system. And, and that kind of a, a supply chain could deliver the methane to the, to the orbit around the Moon. And, and we could have a system where we, we fill up, you know, the, the methane tanks in orbit and the oxygen tanks on the surface and get a lot of benefit. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Now, um, you may be aware of an article that was put out by Dr. Zubrin suggesting that a lunar starship 
be used as a fuel depot carrying the methane that you folks would need, 100 tons worth of methane in orbit. Um, obviously, they're a competitor there, but he uh, advocated the possibility of using them in orbit for the depot and you guys actually for the lander. Is that something that you're aware of and are you in any way willing to comment on that? You know, I, I've heard of things like that. I, I don't know that it, it, it's worth commenting beyond saying, you know, whatever we can do together as a community to have capabilities available around the moon that can service, you know, landers like ours and, and the, the development of the moon that we all would like to see, it's a good thing. Great. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure my listeners, many of whom are SpaceX fans as well, will be uh, very glad to hear that. Um, in addition to that, uh, what I'm curious about also, you have eight engines on this lander, from my understanding, uh, capable of doing an abort almost all the way to the surface. One question was asked of me in terms of, uh, you know, that many engines, are you concerned about it kicking up a lot of uh, lunar regolith or anything along those lines? Or do you have it, uh, have a system in place to, uh, to make up for that um, or, or anything to, to prevent that from happening? You know, the, the, anything that lands is going to kick up a lot of regolith, and the bigger the lander, the more regolith is going to be kicked up. And 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 so, um, what we're in the process of doing is is studying the specific dynamics that are created by our configuration, and then um, you know, understanding what kind of mitigation capabilities we need to do. And and that's really what everybody does. Um, I think you know, until NASA gets or somebody can build a you know a dedicated landing pad that that's regolith-free, um, this is going to be uh, something that we, that we wrestle with. But, you know, it's, it's determinate. It's, it's um, uh, something that we can understand and, and design to, uh, to address, and, and that's what we're doing. Wonderful. Well, I do appreciate that. Um, another question was asked in terms of, could you describe the, the payloads that you bring down how they detach from the uh, from the alpaca? You said you don't use cranes or anything along those lines. So, uh, can you like really briefly explain like the process of a payload? Like, for example, you show a rover detaching from the alpaca. Um, how that's accomplished? You know that sort of thing. So, um, you know, right now we're really focused in on the crewed version of the lander, um, and having an alpaca that can be used to deliver um, large cargo item and items. And, and we've talked with potential large cargo item providers about, you know, what, what, you know, the nature of um, their system and, and, and how we might put them on the surface of the moon, but we haven't really gotten very far in, 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 in that. And so there's nothing really I'm able to share at this point. That's fine, and I figured I'd probably trip over a couple of things uh, as as time went on, so no problems there. Um, let's see here, and and bear with me. I'm making sure that uh, that I get uh, the questions asked here. Um, so uh, I guess there's a, another question here um, from a, a gentleman in England, and he said, quote, the Apollo missions were a defining moment that brought humanity together to celebrate a new frontier being reached. What will it be like for Dynetics if your lander helps crew return to the moon uh, in a few years from now? Well, that's a really great question, and, it, and it's, it's a lot of what motivates it's, it's a lot of, you know, this, these moments are, is a lot of why everybody on the Dynetics team is super excited to be working so hard to, to get there. Um, and and I, I will say, you know, I, I was nine when the Apollo landings took place, and I remember watching it on my grainy TV and really, um, you know, being impacted by it. And there's no question it was a it was one of those moments where people can remember where they were and what they were doing. And, and I think there's so um, there's so many people alive today that that didn't see that. And um, and you know and and so the opportunity to, to take people back to the moon, it, including the first woman, um, it is just, it, it's, it's exciting. And, and, and the, the, the added 
um, the added um, impact comes from the fact that going back this time, you know, we know we're going back to stay. You know, we don't exactly know what the the the, the parameters are around why we stay, right? We know we're going back. There's a lot of science still to do. There's a lot we need to learn about the resources there. There's a lot we want to learn about um, uh, testing capabilities to go to Mars and, and certainly inspiring people and, and, you know, young women with the first woman on the moon. So there's, there's, there's all the reasons why we know we want to go back and, and the, the specific ones that are going to turn into, you know, enough to support an economically viable lunar settlement really aren't quite known today. And that's part of the excitement about it. So um, I, I think um, there's no question that people taking steps off Earth to another planetary body as a first step in, in what's to come next um, will be just as impactful as the unthinkable achievement that the Apollo guys delivered. Um, and so, uh, again, we're all just really excited to be part of it. Well, we are very excited as well, let me tell you. Um, another question, this is from a gentleman in the United States. Um, do you have any plans to engineer the dropped tanks that you're using for reusability and clear them for safe human reuse, that sort of thing? Or are the tanks going to be discarded on the lunar surface? You know, we have played with various ideas for for reusing them. You know, if you can imagine um, uh, producing fuel on the lunar surface and and not having to deliver tankage there specifically for that purpose, you know, let's say you repurpose a tank that, that we dropped um, and, and, and used it for purpose of storing, um, you know, product that is produced on the moon, that's that's a, 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 a really win-win situation. So, so it's certainly something we want to do, we want to consider. Um, another question in terms of, uh, you, you know, a lot of comments have been made about the Blue Origin, um, the height of the Blue Origin lander. And some folks ask me, well, what's the danger considering that you're only operating in one-sixth gravity? Do you care to comment at all as to what the potential dangers might represent for a high ladder for somebody doing an EVA? Well, you know, I think um, certainly the impact of falling off a ladder on the moon is going to be less than falling off a ladder uh, on Earth because of the reduced gravity. But um, but it can't be understated, the risk. I mean, there are the, – the, the lunar regolith is very uh, abrasive. The lunar um, – you know, the, the, the possibility of a crew entanglement into a ladder, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, of, of hazards that – that you know need to be need to be addressed. I mean, that's why ladder companies spend a lot of money on the ergonomics of, of ladders because there are a lot of risks associated with falling, and and the risks are not only those associated with you know the the impact because of one G. Um, and so um, you know, I'll just take it back to the to the dynamic solution. I mean, what we really offer is a a, a lot less complex. Um, a lot less complex uh, opportunity for or, or solution for crew operations on the surface. They, they're, it's a lot easier for them at the end of the day to get back in. It's a lot quicker at the end of the day, the day for them to get back in a land or in a contingency scenario. It's a lot easier for them to bring a, an incapacitated crew member if they need to um, help a buddy who's, who's incapacitated for a reason get back up. I mean, could you imagine if a, if somebody falls off a big, tall lander and, and, and break something, you know, how is this, how, uh, or, or, or springs a leak in the suit. I mean, you've got a critical situation where the buddy has to help them get back up the ladder and into the, into the lander. So again, the, 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 the operations concept, um, uh, relative lack of complexity that's, that's offered by our solution can't be understated. Um, thank you very much. Another thing that uh, that I'm a huge fan of, and just about everybody else I think who watches my channel is a fan of, is reusability in general. And we kind of touched briefly on that. 
Um, and the Blue Origin solution seems to, the transfer element and the lander do not seem to be reusable from what we've seen. And yet it appears that the almost your entire lander is reusable. Would you say that that's a fair statement to make? I, I would. Uh, you know, I think as the, the, that comes from our architecture and the decision to refuel in lunar orbit to enable the to fuel in lunar orbit to to enable the first mission i mean the the and, and the single stage right we have we have the single stage um descent ascent element that 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 it, we can refuel from day one and so um with that it it, it enables um you know the, the kinds of things that you design into a system to enable reusability um, beyond that refueling capability are, are, are a lot less um, daunting, right? You know, just making sure you've got the capability to, um, uh, you know, for longer life on your components and to, or to survive the, the loads of multiple events. Those are all things we, we know how to do, right? We know how to define those requirements and design to them. It's the, it's the refueling, especially of cryogenic components, that's, that's the new thing. And so, you know, by us tackling that from the get-go, we're, we are inherently reusable. And that means from, from the beginning, you know, our first, our first cargo lander can immediately stay in space and, and be reused um, from the beginning. So um, I do think it's, it's important to, to recognize that. Now, I'm pretty certain that I already know the answer to this question, but still, since one of my supporters asked it, I, I'm going to. Is the alpaca going to be capable of completely autonomous operations in terms of going down, depositing its payload, and going back up? Uh, you know, NASA has... Oh, so from a cargo standpoint? Um, yes. You know... I, I think, I mean, I would say yes. I mean, I, I you know, we're working on the specific design details again of the of the of the cargo lander. But it, you know, it, it, in the NASA crew case, they want us to be able to, to to land on the surface, and it's in one of NASA's requirements that we want land on the surface autonomously, but have the ability for the crew to 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 fly the vehicle if necessary. So you know, you build in those inherent capabilities that we would certainly transfer over to the cargo mission. Are you folks also working on your own design for propellant depots in orbit? As I said in the webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, we're not interested in being the, the depot operators or the ground uh, locks plant operators. Um, we're interested in being a transportation provider and a customer for those systems. Right, and forgive me, like I say, these are things I'm sure you've already stated, but nevertheless, a lot of the folks who watch the channel may not have seen the webinar, so I'm just making certain to uh, to cover things that may may come up in their minds. Um, so, I'm sorry if I can if I can interject. I mean, and that's certainly understood. And I think the the webinar also gives your your viewers a a great opportunity to, to understand a little bit more about our vision and, and the kind of partnerships that we that we want to pursue to, uh, to to realize it, not only for the benefit of our lander, but in the commercial prospects of our lander, but also to advance what NASA is trying to do with Artemis. And I will see to it uh, that that webinar is linked uh, in the description of my video for the benefit of those who have not seen it. Um, another, you know, question, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart, of course, in most of the uh, illustrations that I've seen showing your lander in action, it shows Mars, the red planet, in the top right corner of these illustrations. What ambitions do you have in terms of using alpaca on Mars? Obviously, it would need to be different heat shield, that sort of thing. But do you have ambitions for that? Well, we, we certainly have ambitions as a company to support, you know, human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. We, we haven't really done uh, any specific work on our lander portability to the Mars exploration scenario. We're focused on getting people back to the moon as soon as possible and, uh, and enabling the, 
the lunar ecosystem to thrive. You know, I, I think it, it's, it's, you know, we, we, we really would like to see that happen so that um, humanity's next step to Mars is really done in a sustainable manner. You know, um, the idea of, of going to Mars and, and, and planting a flag and being done is really not what, what we space fans want to see. We want to see, see multiple missions to Mars. And, and the foundation that's being laid by the Artemis program on the moon is super important for that. So we're focused on the moon program, but really, um, you know, expect and are excited about the possibility of Mars. I mean, we all want to go to Mars. Well, certainly I do. Um, I'm, I, I hope I live to see it. I, I, I'm sure you hope for the same thing. I was actually born in the year that, uh, that we went to the moon. So obviously we, I have no memory of that whatsoever. Um, so, uh, so I envy the fact that you got to actually see it, uh, when you were a child. Um, but in any event, um, let's see, I want to make certain that I have covered everything that, uh, all the questions that have been asked. I guess the, one of the, the last questions that I want to ask is, you know, you're up against some, some Titanic names, at least as far as household names are concerned in this bid. You're up against, you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. You know, do you feel that the influence that these two extremely wealthy men have are, are going to play anything into this? Uh, or do you think that your product alone and your ship alone is going to be sufficient uh, to win this bid? Um, you know, we are, you know, certainly not a billionaire funded team, but we are very motivated to. Um, to get people back to the moon. And so, um, you know, we're doing everything we can to, to, to win the bid and to be the, 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 um, the, you know, that NASA's preferred partner, um, you know, and demonstrate that through our performance, you know, our, our proposal, um, that, that got us this base period contract was, was the highest rated by NASA. And we're super proud of that. And, and, and that we did, we received that because of our innovative, design, our innovative, quick-thinking, agile team, um, our, our great team of, of partners around the country. I mean, we've picked a set of teammates that really, you know, know exactly what the task is at hand and, um, and have a lot of good things to contribute. And so we're working together uh, amazingly as a team. So, so we're really excited about, about the team and, um, and looking forward to winning one of these option A contracts and, and, and competing against whoever is is also selected by NASA to get people to the moon. And we hope we're there. We hope we're first. Well, I hope for the same thing. One last question. I promise this is the last one. Um, can you, aside from the, the lunar rover that was depicted uh, in one of your animations and obviously bringing people down to the surface, can you give me some other examples, if, if any, of types of cargo or other types of modules that the alpaca might be able to bring down to the lunar surface? It can bring uh, habitat modules. It can bring, um, let's say, an, an ISRU power plant. You know, I think in, to get to the kind of fuel production on the surface that we'd all like to see, whether it's starting with water ice or starting with oxygen in the regolith, we'll, you know, we'll start out with some smaller scale um, pilot plants so we can, we can bring that kind of a thing. Um, we can also bring... Uh, um, uh, larger power kind of capabilities as NASA, you know, to get their base camp uh, organized and, and, uh, and operational, they're, they're, they're envisioning some basic services that can support multiple users of the base camp, like, like big power systems. So we can deliver, um, we can deliver power systems. You know, the, the good thing about the alpaca as a cargo delivery system is, you know, we're limited in what we could launch, inside the fairing um, launching from Earth due to the just the geometry of the fairing. But if we picked up a payload in cislunar space that was launched um, separately, um, it could be bigger in a different shape, and so we can deliver a lot of, of interesting cargo to the surface. And I'll say lastly, there's a lot of interesting science priorities, right? You know, from from understanding the the 
geologic significance on the far side in the South Bowl Aiken Basin to to the lava tubes that are around the moon to to you know all sorts of you know geophysical network type ideas you know there there's a lot of different science missions that that uh, people are talking about and I think once a large lander like ours is available and a large lander that can you know gently put something down on the surface is available um, the science community um, is so creative there will be no end to the ideas for for interesting science missions that, that we can enable with our lander so um, we're, we're excited about all those missions as well well thank you again um, ma'am I just went and lied to you and if you don't want to answer another question I quite understand however just one more occurred to me and please forgive me it wouldn't be the first time that I've lied to somebody <laughs> Um, the alpaca can be delivered as obviously, as you know, in one portion by the SLS or in three portions by the, uh, the Vulcan, um, which configuration would you prefer? Which configuration do you think is, is the best way to deliver this lander? Well, I mean, our baseline is to use the ULA Vulcan launcher. So that's the way we're pursuing now, um, you know, having if the SLS becomes available, uh, can it be an alternate launch vehicle? Of course, but you know the Vulcan and our partnership with ULA is important to us, so we're we're going down that path. All right, and that that will be my last question. So once again, um, you have uh, given us a lot of your extremely valuable time for that. I am extremely grateful, and I'm sure my uh, my listeners, my washers, are also very very grateful. So once again, thank you very much, and we will conclude the interview unless there's something else you would like to say. No, I, I really appreciate the excitement that you're generating around our our lander and 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 then um by extension around the, the the lunar missions to come so really appreciate it and it was a pleasure talking with you today jordan thank you very much so i hope this interview has demonstrated to you that although i am a huge fan of the starship and although i think the lunar starship may have a role to play in the whole artemis project it can't do everything there are other ships that serve the purpose of landing on the moon at least in a scouting process far better than the lunar starship could but it still has a very important role to play in my opinion Again, much thanks to Dynetics, and as always, stay angry about space.